mother, father, three kids, cat and a dog, white picket fence, blah. There it is. Now, so the family unit can be uh, two females, it can be two males, the family unit can be mom and dad, and grandma and grandpa, and uncle. Family units have changed. And we're going back to, you remember years ago, families grew up close together, side by side. Families grew up with maybe the grandparents living with the family. Then we changed where grandparents didn't live with the family. Then it was where people didn't go back to their community. We moved all over the U.S. So no one was in proximity to anybody. Now, our, if you'll notice that some of our, our socialization and uh, sociology, we're coming back to family units again where pods live together, where kids move back in with their families, grandmas move back in, or everybody's a unit again. So it, it's changed over the years, and part of that's because of our economic times, social change, etc. You know, we used to put grandma and grandpa in a nursing home, and now only certain people can afford that type of care, so grandma and grandpa may be taken care of at home. Just look at your family units and know that it's based upon a lot on economic, social, women working now. Years ago, women didn't work. Now women are one of some of the major breadwinners. It takes two incomes to, to work in many families. So grandparents move back in to help take care of some of the kids. So the oldest is, is like I said at the very beginning, mom, dad, mom stays home, dad works, et cetera, et cetera. But now we have all these different types of <coughs> families. But we know that the function of the family is just what it is. Physical, emotional, intellectual, social, and spiritual. That's what the function of it is. You're giving support. Maslow's hierarchy of needs right here. You've got physical needs, emotional needs, uh, your intellectual stimulus. Civilization, you've got your socialization on how people can learn to get along with people in society. I mean, that's why preschools were first started up, so kids could interact and share toys and get along with each other before they went to primary school. Uh, and then starting that uh, issue with trying to get education started sooner, so their brains were ready to take on the, the major tax tax tasks of learning as their society became more industrialized. Spirituality, all of that. So some of this makes common sense, you know, food, shelter, clothing, emotional support, playing, stimulating others to be with, knowing how to say no, knowing how to share, et cetera, et cetera. Extended families, I already said, that's with your grandparents and other siblings, maybe aunts and uncles. Communal living, you know, that was some of the things that we had like out in uh, Waco, some of those other areas where you had pods of families living together. Uh, we don't have the traditional families as much anymore. Like I said, we have foster care, we have a lot of adoption, we have surrogacy. We have cohabitation, uh, where people don't get married. Uh, where, and this, can, and this is one of those issues, again, where you cannot let your biases, your religious beliefs, affect the way you deal with, with individuals. Whether it is a same-sex marriage and they have children, whether it is individuals who are not, quote, quote, legally married, you're not looking at that, you're just seeing if the functions of the family is being met. The physical, emotional, intellectual, socialization, spiritual, when you're looking at children, okay? Family size used to be large, family size was decreasing, and that part of that came from air economics factors in the United States, and mom's going back, back to work. You know, it used to be we have children very close together, and children help raise children. Uh, things changed, and now um, there was the age of the TV children, where you plopped them in front of the TV and let the TV be the babysitter. Uh, I know you all have probably seen this commercial where the mom on TV, before she lets anybody hold the baby, she has to, she's wash, you know, makes them wash their hands and ask if they have any cold. And then the next child, she puts the pacifier up off the ground and gives it to the baby. So first time moms, you know, have that kind of philosophy. Now, second, third time around, totally different. They even have here in Roanoke, are you aware of what they call family night dinner? Where they try to, and you'll see it publicized on TV, the Prevention Council tries to advocate that. There's one night a week where families sit down for a family dinner 
because they try to get back to that socialization of families together, communicating, talking, instead of everybody going up to different directions and not having that family unit. Um, divorce has an impact upon kids, especially not only toddlers and young children, it affects adolescents and older teenagers as well. So there can be issues that evolve from divorce for uh, children feeling abandoned, feeling unloved, that can lead to, as you get into your pediatrics, into some issues with the children and substance abuse. Then culture. Culture plays a major role on how people interact, whether grandma lives with the family or not. Some of our ethnic groups really have a much stronger family unit than the typical American population. So, you know, when somebody has a baby, you'll look outside and the whole family, from grandma, grandpa, brothers, sisters, everybody has come to visit uh, out there or maybe sit in the, in the lobby while they're in labor. So you have to look at culture to see how it affects the client or the patient. See, I grew up in grad school where everybody was called a client. So my brain says client every now and then. Now we're back to being called patients again. Okay? Uh, just because someone dresses different, uh, has different beliefs, has different religion, has different food preferences, we have to be careful, find out what the patient needs are, and I'm sure you all have had that in med surge. <coughs> so the same thing applies in OB, when you're trying to educate a mom and she's on a certain ethnic type diet, is she getting all the nutrients that she needs? Uh, some of the students in the past have told me how in their country, women ate clay. It was normal to eat clay. They were told when they were pregnant to eat clay. Uh, you know, I was freaking out. No, you don't do that. And they said, no, we were told to do that. Uh, they were told certain things with their babies to take them out and put them in the sunlight. And I'm like, no, no, don't take that little baby's fresh skin and put it in the sunlight. Part of their culture was to do that. That was a norm. That, and when I would freak out, they were like, why are you freaking out? It's okay. Because that was their belief, that was their policy. They were not Americans, okay? They were from a country in Africa. This is what they did. It was okay for them in their country to do this. And it served a purpose. And it did, when I finally did research, it was a certain mineral they were lacking in their diet, and they got it from clay. So, um, but it took me a while to accept the fact that I have a question about the sunlight. Um, well, I have a question about the sunlight. Um, I have a son who's 26 now, but when he was born, he just had a little bit of jaundice, and they yeah. put him underneath the light. Yeah. And, and then he, got, they, he said it to, you know, when you pinch his nose, it's still a little bit yellow. He said just sit him in front of the window. For, That's right. Absolutely. So. Sunlight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That That's was due, part of it. That was due to the vitamin D, right? It, no, it takes the unconjugated bilirubin and turns it to conjugated so you can excrete it out. Oh. It's not necessarily vitamin D. It's because of the bilirubin buildup. We'll go over that in here. Uh, we will, we'll have a little session on that in here. Uh, but things like that, you have to look back at. Um, one thing that you do need to know from this chapter is what is, and here's the nuclear, the extended, the single, the communal, you know, laying gesbian, step families, blended families, cohabitation, adaptive families, blah, 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 blah. All right, family size, family structure. We're all different, right? So, and we see that. Roanoke is a very good area to live in for <coughs> differences in ethnic populations. We have a wide span here in the Roanoke Valley, so you have an exposure to a lot of different things. And as a nurse taking care of patients, you will be taking care of many different ethnic groups in private practice or in clinics, okay? Uh, what you do need to know are these definitions. These will definitely be on your NCLEX, not just for OB, but for all med surge. You need to understand what primary prevention is, secondary prevention, and tertiary. Do you all know what that is? Tertiary prevention. Tertiary prevention is what? Give me an example. Um, a disease that you've been diagnosed with and you're taught to, like diabetes. Like living with it. Right, or orthopedic clinics for, well, I'm trying to gear it to air, air course, but um, spina bifida, uh, children with or, uh, some type of club, club foot, cleft lip, specialty care, 
Well, if you all coming out of med surge, it would be your nursing, uh, skilled nursing care facilities. That's tertiary care. All right. Okay. Rehab. Anything that's rehab. Chip. All right. Anything that you're doing in the public health department where you're following up on a disease. So primary is what? Prevention. Prevention. Diet, exercise, safety, immunization, school nurses, drug awareness. Anything that's prevention is primary. What is secondary? Treatment, the, the problem itself? Or screening, screening. after eating. Yeah. Okay. So that would be like your vision, more vision tests and height and weight, coming up with a plan, fluoride for the kids. So wouldn't that be school prevention, goes? like in a way? Prevent, prevention. Like, You're educating. I always think primary is more education. Okay. Gear it to, to uh, preventing it. Um, primary care is educating. Okay? okay. When you get into secondary, think of it as more of an assessment <coughs> for screening for a problem. All right, scoliosis screening, things like that. Screening activities, height, weight, ear, and vision tests. I'm trying to gear it to Air, air Force and not just mid surge. You will see this on your NCLEX. They will have something about tertiary, secondary, or primary care. Examples, and you got to figure out which one it is. We kind of briefly already talked about birthing centers, um, how women nowadays can either birth at home, you can go to a birthing center, you can go to a hospital. And we still do home births around here. Doulas will go to the home, and there are home deliveries in the Roanoke Valley. Birthing centers, usually you don't, aren't offered any epidurals or any pain management, but you're there with a professional to help you if you need it in your home environment. It may just be a doula. It may not be a nurse. You could hire a midwife. Uh, birthing centers are ran by a lot of midwives and nurse practitioners. And of course, in your hospital setting, you've got everything that you need in case something goes wrong. Many physicians will say, you know, you're a candidate for a birthing center. You're a candidate for home delivery. Uh, some physicians won't touch it with a fine tooth comb because of liability issues. They want everybody in a hospital because you never know. No pregnancy is the same. You never know when a problem is going to occur. Everything can be normal for nine months and then bam, you go into labor and problems develop. So, uh, in the chapter, those at home and birthing centers are common more now because of it being comfortable. I mean, other than the difference between those two, nothing really. Right. A doula or a midwife may be in your home, and your birthing centers is predominantly midwives, nurse practitioners, okay. things like that. Okay. <coughs> and, you know, in your birthing centers, they may have some immediate, uh, like, oxygen and sun equipment for resuscitation, but they're not going to have all the bells and whistles. If there's a complication. In other words, they can't do a C-section. In other words, they can just do CPR, basic things like that to protect you till the rescue squad comes and takes you to the hospital. So there's nothing fancy in a in a birthing center. Some peds they have oxygen, you know, code cards, things like that, but not anything more than than that. LDRs, LDRPs, you know some. It, it was a time where you went in, you labored, you birthed, and you postpartum all in one room. Now you may labor in one room, deliver in one room, and go back to your room because they couldn't keep supplying all these LDRP rooms on areas that had a lot of births. So smaller areas can that only have like maybe five or five births a day. They have five rooms that can do it, but areas that had a lot of births. They need that movement. And you know, like at Carillion, postpartum's on a different floor than the labor floor. So you get moved. Years ago, it was you stayed all in one place till you were discharged. Uh, we've already touched on case management. We've touched on being a patient advocate. More focus on some wellness doing your assessment of your patient to find out what they're lacking in, what resources are available for them. You know, our home health has grown so much. Many of you all may become in home health. You know, some agencies do hire LPNs for home health. The RNs are the ones who do the assessments 
and the planning of the process, and then the LPN comes in or the nursing assistant and does the care, certain dressing changes, certain procedures, certain things with pick lines, et cetera, et cetera. So home health is a big <coughs> thing. Is home health big for peds? What do y'all think? Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a complication. Yeah, absolutely. There's our nurses that specialize in pediatric uh, home health care. Uh, phototherapy. There are Billy lights that people take home now. There's IV antibiotic therapy. There's respiratory vent care for babies. Uh, your cerebral palsy babies who have to have a lot of care. So PT, obviously, OT, <coughs> speech, things like that. School nurses, there's some agencies that will hire LPNs as school nurses instead of RNs. So there's a lot of opportunities for you all in the community in public, public health and community health with screening, uh, things like that going into schools, summer camps. A lot of nurses work in summer camps, like for uh, disabilities, uh, asthma, certain respiratory, certain uh, cerebral palsy, diabetes, CP, AIDS, and camps for children where their parents have died. So there's all the types of summer camps offered for children to go to, to be able to cope, and nurses work in those camps. Community centers, some, not so much here in Roanoke, but when you move out of Roanoke, there are community centers that hire nurses to be available. There are churches, large churches, that hire nurses so their patients can come in, especially when you live in communities, where uh, clients can, church members can come in and have blood pressure checked, to see a nurse, things like that. <coughs> um, I have an acquaintance who is a nurse practitioner and she's in West Virginia, and she travels in a van to, oh, around a county and does health assessments and sees clients. She can write prescriptions and things like that, and that's how certain areas in certain parts of West Virginia receive care. That's her job. She drives this big van. I'm talking a Winnebago-type van <laughs> around because they go all over and do certain procedures and certain things for clients that can't get out of where they live. So community care is a big thing, church groups, all of that's available out there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on teaching. Hopefully they have <coughs> gone over most of that with you guys in the past. We would have spent a lot of time talking about how to interview and ask questions and pick up subjective and objective data, but I think it's for semester nurses. You guys should know how to do that, right? Make sure your communication is when you listen open-ended questions, and when you teach, how do you teach someone to do something? This is always a good NCLEX type question. You demonstrate it, they return demonstrate it, right? And then you see if there's any questions. You can do educational sessions in one-on-one. -on -one. You can do educational sessions like in classrooms. Prenatal classes, that's one of those where nurses can be involved in patient teaching. Uh, prenatal from nutrition to exercise to breathing to labor techniques, okay? So prenatal teaching is a big thing where nurses are involved. There are times where you may teach the whole family or you may just teach the actual client certain skills. There are issues where you're doing phone follow-up calls with your patients. Keep teaching in the back of your head. That's always a good when you're doing an NCLEX question, it's always good to look to see what they are asking in that question. You know how to highlight your questions, correct? Underline keywords and find out are they asking for a nursing action or a patient outcome. So make sure you pay attention when you read your questions, okay? We've already talked about dealing with poverty. You know, when people cannot afford certain things, you will not have compliance. You may have women who cannot afford to take their prenatal vitamins. So we already know that without folic acid, babies are at risk to develop turo, spinal bifida, any type of neuro <coughs> defects. Okay, so you've got to have folic acid for that. So if moms are not getting that prenatal care, which could be something as simple as taking a vitamin, we've got to find the resources out there. 
Finances are the biggest thing for compliance. Is mom getting a lot of fresh vegetables? Is mom eating fast food and already has a high blood pressure and already has a high sodium content? Is she going to be more likely to develop eclampsia? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So these are the things that you would assess when you're dealing with your patients and your teaching. Obviously the most ones I see about smoking for sure. Okay? I've gone through that chapter. You good? Let's look at this question so we can answer this one. A community health nurse uses a different set of skills than those used by the institution. Makes sense, right? I'm a community health nurse. I'm not like going in med surge at 7 o'clock in the morning and doing a physical assessment, am I? I'm in the community. I will end up doing a physical assessment, but where am I spending most of my time? Communicating, right? Trying to do the prevention, trying to figure out are they following guidelines, are they taking their meds? So a community health nurse has to be a little bit different from a hospital-based nurse. Uh, which skill used by the community health nurse is the process which ensures the client's health and services needs are met? You're an advocate, use the nursing process, you prioritize, use case management. Tough question, isn't it? I would say advocacy, but... What about case management? Because it's like a social worker, and if you're in the community... Let's see what our textbook says. The case management. Because this is the process that you're sharing that they are... The key words over here were a process, which you think, okay, nursing process... Okay, so I, I would take out advocacy because I'm looking for a process, okay? And then I have to look at health and services <coughs> needs. So if I'm a case manager, I'm making sure you're getting that follow-up for hearing if you have a hearing problem, that follow-up to the cleft lip, cleft palate clinic, that follow-up to dental, that follow-up to um, an immunologist or respiratory if, you're C if you have cerebral palsy. So I am making sure that your needs are being met. So I have to case manage your case. Remember those phone calls? You didn't come in today. You know, this was the, the visit you were supposed to come. Oh, did you not go to the plumologist today? What happened? Your baby was supposed to go to have their lungs checked after they've been a preemie in, in the, the unit. Does this make sense, guys? Okay. All right, so there's that chapter. Now we're going to three. This is your anatomy and physiology. We should go quickly with this one. See, usually the first day we get an introduction. I don't have to go so fast and we can just learn each other. But this is where we're going to go. All right. So this is a review. You've already had A and P. If you don't remember the anatomy of the male and female, then you need to go back and look it up. Okay? I'm not going to stand up here and reteach it. And I wouldn't have done that if it wasn't a snow day either, but um, just go back and review your anatomy and physiology. You need to know what certain names are when they come up in a question, especially when we get into complications and problems. What are we talking about? We know the purpose of all this, right? It's to have a baby, right? Um, to produce offspring. Um, and in secondary functions, uh, you know, got to warn you, you know, I will talk about vagina, I'll talk about penises, I'll talk about all this stuff. If it embarrasses you, I'm sorry, but that's what OB is. All right, if you're an OB nurse, you have you cannot have any any embarrassment about opening up somebody's legs and looking at their labia and seeing what's going on. And you have to have no fear in OB. I've had my fingers up in somebody's vagina many times trying to figure out what's going on here. How, how are they faced? Are they dilated? You can't have that kind of timidness if you work in OB. OB is like, lay it out there, everything's exposed, okay? So just keep that in mind, okay? Um, male and female anatomy parts, we'll kind of go through a couple of them here just to make sure you still remember. So, what are the, um, the male first? I mean female first. All right. We know we've got the testes, right? And that's where the wonderful sperm is produced. And this is where mom or the infant 
the fetus, as I'll call it, gets half of its genetic material. In the male, it's the urinary tract and the reproductive system are kind of like connected, right? You don't have to, I'm not going to ask you name the male anatomy on a test. I'm not going to do that. You've already had that, right? So but we just need to kind of review the functions and what's going on here. Um, the scrotum is very important for a male because that's where the testicles live and that is where men who, there's infertility problems can occur. So as in an infertility clinic, if you were talking to a male, you may ask him what? What do you think you may ask? This is where the testicles live, down in the scrotum. Have you had any injuries? Have you had any in injuries? You will even be more in depth than that. Do you wear tight clothing? Do you wear tight whiteies? What kind of underwear do you wear? If there's an infertility issue, we don't want you to wear tidy whities We want you to wear boxers to let your scrotum hang down. <coughs> because you know what the body does when, the, when it's um, hot outside, the scrotum releases and lets the, the testicles hang lower so they stay cooler. When it's cold outside, what does the scrotum do? It shrivels up so the testicles can stay warmer so the sperm can live. That is just part of male anatomy. So when you're doing an infertility test, usually you do it on males first because the women is much more complicated. You'll go in and say, tell me about your underwear. Tell me what kind of job you have. Tell me what kind of exercise you do. Jogging, things like that are not going to really affect it. But sitting on a bicycle seat, overheating your body, heat, heat can kill the sperm. All right? So that may be what we say. Sitting at a desk all day long with the testicles close to their body increases body heat. So these are questions you ask especially after they've done a sperm count and you've got a low sperm. You're going to delve into their personal habits. So this is what I said. You can't be embarrassed in OB when you've got to talk to a male. And in trauma, yes. Has there been any trauma at the Indian Falls, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll get into things like um, STIs and, and all that stuff. Does that make sense? So that's why we have to know about the male anatomy. Where is it? What's it doing? Um, and in the duct system, I was hoping there was a picture in here, so I don't have my picture. Here we go. All right, you have to look at the picture in the book. Um, I get this course mixed up with my OB, the RN course, but we have a big male anatomy picture. Uh, let's look on page, if you have your book, if not page 50. And remember, uh, you know where the testicles are down in the scrotum, and then the next thing is what? The epididymis, right? So after the sperm, if the sperm lives, the, the sperm lived in the testicles, and at the time of sexual intercourse, you're going to pass through the thing <coughs> called the epididymis. That is the area that is still in the scrotum, but guess where? It travels out of the scrotum, up through the body, and then goes where next? What is the part of the male anatomy that is cut during sterilization? What do they have? Vas Vasectomy. Okay, so the vas deferens is the area that gets cut. Okay? So you move on up, and there we have the vas deferens, and then look, it wanders over here around. It's going to come across, and this is where the male reproductive system and the male urinary system kind of join. You're going to come around till you see where the bladder is, and then you're going to see that we have two, we have the uh, seminal vesicle, okay? And then you're going to have the duct that passes it through until the sperm or the semen, we'll call it semen now, we're going to go back and review a little bit more of The semen gets into the urethra and then passes out of the body during sexual intercourse. So it has a long journey. Did you notice that? From down here in the testicle, up through the pelvis, across into the abdominal cavity, right? The pelvic cavity, across the bladder, the back side of the bladder, where it joins in and see, there is a valve there so you don't urinate when you're having sexual intercourse, okay? 
Now, let's talk about what some of these other things are doing. Semen. Do you understand the scrotum, correct? Mm -hmm. The penis is just an avenue for penetration, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know how, what makes it become, we'll use the word hard. Blood supply. Blood supply. There, there are um, state, blood pools in there. there. The vessels dilate and blood pools in there and that's what causes the, the erection, okay? <laughs> now, when you get down here to, let's see where we go, now hormones, yes. Dual system, yes, we just talked about. It. Starts on the journey, yes. <coughs> it's starting on a journey, which is a long way. Do you think sperm have to have fuel and food to live? It's a living thing, right? It has to have some sort of food source. That food source comes from when we start on our journey through the seminal vesicles, okay? It's alkaline. Why do you think it's alkaline? Because the female is acidic. acidic. So this has to be alkaline for the sperm to survive in the vaginal tract through the uterus or it would die. Right? So semen is alkaline. That is one of the key factors that it needs to help it survive through the female. It also has sugar. It's got to have sugar because it's got to swim. What does sperm got to do? Swim. They have to have a lot of energy and get on their destination up to the fallopian tube. They have got a lot of work. So the semen is loaded with sugar, which helps in this process. Then you've got some other things that, that get excreted out of this. The semen gives you some more milky product. Um, but it's just the liquid that helps in the process. Does that make sense? Um, let me look at my notes real quick. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the anatomy of the penis. Like I said, you just need to know that there's sinuses in there and erection is caused from dilatation. This is why it's important if a male, okay, tell me if a male's taking a nitrate and he takes Viagra, is there a problem? Yeah. Can something happen to their heart? Blood pressure. Why does their blood pressure drop? Their vasodil that cause vasodilatation. Viagra causes vasodilatation. Nitrates cause vasodilatation. That's what causes the erection, is the blood pooling in the penis, okay? So that's the type of thing I, I need for you all to know. I don't care if you understand anatomy and physiology. I need you to know it's vasodilatation. So any drug that causes vasodilatation is going to drop somebody's blood pressure. So a man may say, well, I'm not having an erection. I need Viagra. So they give them Viagra, but they always need to ask those type of patients, are you on any nitrates? Do you have any other agents? Are you on any blood pressure medicines that vasodilate, some type of calcium blocker or whatever, because it can potentiate a drop in their blood pressure. Correct? Does that make sense? All right. Uh, we already talked about the scrotum. Its job is to protect the testicles from temperature. Keep them warm, keep them cool, all right? Infertility issue, we already talked about underwear. We talked about um, males are usually the first one tested in the infertility because it's much easier to do a sperm count than anything else. And the most inexpensive um, to do that to check for uh, the, the maturity of the sperm, the count of the sperm before we do anything with the female because it could just be a male issue before we move on. Talked about the epididymis. Just like in the female, you have follicle stimulating hormone, the pituitary does the same thing for the male, okay? You have this um, follicle stimulating hormone which stimulates the testicles to produce their, their sperm. From the epididymis, we go into the vas deferens. We already talked about that. We go through the inguinal canal, up over the bladder, till we get to the ejaculatory duct, and then we come around to the urethra where the seminal vesicles are, and that's where we pick up our nourishment along our journey that we've got to go on. And we need that alkaline to help us live in the female anatomy. You got that? Quick overview. All right, let's talk about the female. A little bit about your... Uh, 
You know what the mons pumis is. You know what the labia major and labia minora are. You know about those, okay? You know that during sexual intercourse or sexual excitement, female also has dilatation in her um, peritoneum area, in her labia. The blood vessels there also dilate. There's more blood flow to the female, just like in the male, to help with stimulating satisfaction for the female. The, um, you know, the labia are just folds that help to protect the vagina. There are sweat glands and things there to help keep everything moist and lubricated. These glands uh, secrete more acidic so the female does not always get an infection because due to our anatomy, what is it? It's wet, it's moist, it's dark. So we're a prime candidate for bacteria and fungi to grow, correct? So those bacteria do not like to live in an acidic environment. So that's why our vaginal secretions are acidic to try to keep down us from developing infections. But that acidity of us decreases the livability of the sperm. So that's why the male has the alkaline component that the sperm travel in. Also, you need to remember that the musculature in our peritoneum, from the vaginal canal to the anus, your peritoneum is a muscle. This is the part that will stretch as, long, as well as the vaginal wall during your delivery. It is a muscle. Is this what tears? This is what tears from the vaginal opening to the anus, okay? That is the area that tears, and that's where the episiotomy is done. And we'll talk about that when we get to delivering, okay? This is the area that you want that they will cut if you need an episiotomy. But it is a muscle, and it is going to stretch. We will watch a delivery in here, okay? But the big thing is the pH, okay? We're acidic, female acidic, male alkaline. Got it? Now, <laughs> these glands that we have um, in the female do the same purpose. It's to try to increase the, um, like the, the vesicles in the uh, male, our Bartholomew or our glands, Cowper glands in the female, they do the same purpose, secrete mu mucus to help. And we're going to talk about that mucus when we have, um, talk about how to get pregnant. Because their vaginal secretions change uh, during ovulation to help the sperm survive. All right, now, so, <coughs> The birth canal, it, like I said, it's a tube. All it is is a muscle that can dilate, all right? The uterus is pear-shaped, and we're going to briefly talk about menses. I think you've already had that, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. But the purpose of the uterus is to prepare for the implantation of an egg, a fertilized egg. That's the purpose of the uterus. That's why we have our monthly cycles, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Right now we're just talking about the structure. So the cervix is the base of the uterus, and it's what connects um, the vaginal canal to the uterus, and we talk about an os. The os, that's the opening, and we talk about dilatation. In OB, that's what we're talking about. It has your cervix dilated, and we're talking about the os, the little slit, the little opening. This is how individuals who develop PID from sexually transmitted diseases, this is a slit, it's an opening. The bacteria can climb through there very easily, travel through the uterus, fallopian tubes, and cause scarring, and that's one of the leading causes of infertility is scarring of your fallopian tube, okay? So you have the the cervix is the bottom part of the uterus, we'll say, or the top part of the uh, <coughs> vaginal canal. The isthmus is just the, the part that's going to connect to the body, the meaty, fleshy part of the uterus, the corpus. And then the fundus is the top part. The fundus is the part that's what we're going to talk about when we feel the height of the fundus to help determine pregnancy. It's the fundus. It's 
the top part of the uterus, that we will measure, we will be measuring the height of the fundus to help us determine weeks of gestation. We will measure the height of the fundus to help us determine the weeks of gestation because there's been determined at 24 weeks where that height of the fundus should be, at 36 weeks, et cetera, et cetera. This is the part that you will be feeling for in postpartum to make sure the uterus is contracting and so mom doesn't hemorrhage. So the fundus is very important. That is the part that the nurse feels on the abdomen when she's checking for fundal height or she's feeling for contraction during labor or that she feels for postpartum to make sure it's firm and mom is not hemorrhaging. Will we also go over what it is for like multiple births? Yeah, uh, not so much multiple, no. We're doing just one normal. We're all normal. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So when they hemorrhage, it's just because it stays open? It doesn't contract. The uterus will contract back down. It will actually contract. Oh, okay. And when it doesn't and it stays up, then we're measuring the height of the fundus. So if we know it's still high, we know it hasn't contracted down. After birth, the fundus should be one inch above the umbilicus. You're going to learn that. Okay. Right? But I'm just giving you these terms. When I talk about fundus, you'll know what I'm talking about. The top part of the uterus. And then the uterine wall has muscles. It's another muscle. It's just like any, just like your heart muscle. You got your parametrium, you got your myometrium, and you got your endometrium. Then we've got all these ligaments holding it in place. You got your round ligament. You've got your um, <coughs> uterine ligament. Okay. You got your cardinal ligament. You have all these ligaments that are holding the uterus in place, but still letting it grow because the fundus. And the body of the uterus is what grows, not the base, not the isthmus or where the cervix is. <coughs> so when they say they're checking your cervix? They're checking to see if you dilated. Okay. They're seeing if that os has opened. Okay. All right? We're checking effacement and dilatation. Okay? Gotcha. But right now, just make sure you know when I talk about the fundus, you know what I'm talking about. If I talk about... The myometrium, you'll know I'm talking about the muscle area of the uterus, or the endometrium, the inside lighting. So we have the broad ligament, the cardinal ligament, the round ligament. All of these help anchor the uterus in place. So it can free float. Just think about it. It's like a, here's a ball, and I've got these two strings coming from it here. I've got these strings coming from it here, and these strings coming from it here. It holds the uterus just in your abdominal cavity, so it can move around. So it can go up when you become pregnant. And so it can come back down, but still stay attached to the cervix, okay? <coughs> and then when mom says, oh, I have a little twinge over here, it's probably a round ligament being pulled on as her uterus grows, okay? That's what she's feeling, these ligaments being pulled on. So fallopian tubes are next. Yes, this is the part that uh, the passage from the ovary that the egg travels until it lands in the uterus. It's your fallopian tubes, very, very tiny microscopic, long but very, very thin and tiny. You don't really have to worry about the three, the word, worry about the three parts of the fallopian tube. But it is very critical, critical for conception. If there's a blockage in the fallopian tube, mom cannot get pregnant. We have two ovaries, yes, okay, just like the male has two testicles. This is where we produce our estrogen and our progesterone, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about the menstrual cycle. All of this is regulated by the pituitary, air follicle stimulating hormone, which makes the ovary um, release a corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum is what releases progesterone, which helps the uterus proliferate and develop its lining, and that's what we excrete during our menses, during our period. If there is no fertilization of an egg, the corpus luteum dies after about 10 to 12 days, and that's when you start to shed the lining of your uterus and your menses. Okay? So when you're on your period, you're not releasing the egg. The egg has already been released. When you're on, no. I, your egg is being developed for the next cycle. There's a thing going on with the ovary, and there's a thing going on with the uterus. There are two different phases, and they're doing two different things. 
when you are shedding your lining, that means you're not pregnant, obviously, and the estrogen and progesterone levels have dropped. Okay. So you shed because the uterus is trying to prepare for a fertilized egg. When those levels drop, the uterus knows there's no egg, so it starts to shed. But the brain, when those levels drop, say, okay, time for another egg to be developed. And the follicle-stimulating hormone sends a note to the ovary, and the ovary's going, corpus luteum, let's start being developed. So you start developing your cysts that rupture to make the corpus luteum really thin. Mm -hmm. right, so there's two cycles going on. You've got two different things going on in this process. One that develops the uterus, one that develops the egg. Okay? And we'll spend a little bit more time on this because that helps with understanding conception. Because you can get pregnant while on your period. Yes, you can. Yeah. yeah. That's why, because there's two things going on. Uh -huh. Yeah. It depends on if you're regular or irregular and how your cycle goes. Absolutely. And if you're irregular, God help you try to figure it out because you don't know when you're ovulating and when you're not. I have a friend just had a baby a couple months ago who breastfeeding, and I said, you can get pregnant while you're breastfeeding. No, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you okay. can. <laughs> Duh. Okay. All right, puberty occurs around 10 to 14 years of age. Okay, great. Yes, we kind of know that. And we're going to talk a little bit about this menses here. Um, I showed you the male anatomy. Let's look at the female real quick on page 54. I am going to get finished with chapter 3 before we depart. Um, you see the fundus, that's the top of the uterus, you've got that. You see down here your vaginal canal with the rugae, which is just the ridges that help with stimulation and satisfaction. It also helps to allow the vaginal canal to open up. You see the os, what we call the opening. You see the lining of the uterus, the parametrium, the myometrium, the endometrium. And then you look, your fallopian tubes, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the corpus luteum. As it ruptures, that is the, the egg being released, and usually fertilization occurs in the first third of the fallopian tube. If this tube gets blocked, that's where we have problems with when we, if someone has a lot of pain and starts bleeding and a severe abdominal pain and their blood pressure drops, they can have an ectopic pregnancy. That's something we'll talk about later, but you'll know where an ectopic pregnancy is if you look at this drawing. That's the reason why I'm just reviewing anatomy, so you'll know when I say ectopic pregnancy in the first half of the fallopian tube, you have an idea where it is. <coughs> if you look on 55, you see where the ligaments are, and they help hold it in place, and you see where the... You see where the uterus sits on top of the what? Bladder. So those first couple of months of pregnancy when mom has to go pee all the time, you know why? Baby's growing, uterus is growing, and it's pushing down on, causing pressure on the bladder. So when the uterus, and during the second trimester when the uterus is up in the abdominal cavity, mom doesn't have to go to the bathroom as much because it's out of the peritoneum. It's in the abdominal cavity where it's risen up. Then as mom goes into the last trimester, and the closer she gets to deliver, guess what? She's got to go back to the bathroom again. So these are things that you will educate mom to understand. That's why I want you to know that's this part of the anatomy so you understand. All right, so the last page is 56. So on 56, this is your cycle. If you don't understand this, I advise you to read it one more time, okay? <coughs> Look at my notes to make sure I'm not missing anything for you guys here. Fallopian tubes, movement. All right, puberty, 10 to 14. Budding of the breast usually start about age 10. All right, so we have an ovarian cycle. And if you look at this, your ovarian hormones, you'll see how you have the follicle, I'm on page 56, you have the follicle stimulating hormone, which causes ovulation, okay? You will have rupture of follicles, you will have one that survives, you will have more, but you'll have one that, mat that matures into an ovum, okay? The rest kind of disintegrate out. When this process occurs, this all comes from your anterior pituitary, you have a thing called luteinizing hormone. 
Luteinizing hormone keeps the corpus luteum alive to produce progesterone and estrogen to make that. You'll see during the progesterone level rise and the ovarian hormones, if you'll look at that little blue color there, day 15 to 26, that is the development of the lining of the uterus. Progesterone is causing the uterus lining to grow thick, so an implantation of the egg can occur. If an implantation doesn't occur, the corpus luteum starts to die. It doesn't produce any more estrogen or progesterone. So now what happens is that fertilized egg, that implants, starts producing the estrogen and the progesterone that keep the, the uterus growing. But if there's no implanted egg, then there's no development of a placenta, there's no more estrogen, so your estrogen and progesterone levels drop, you go back to your pituitary that says, okay, here we start the whole process over. So if you look at these two diagrams together, it kind of gives you a better picture to understand. The ovarian phase, see day one, here we go. We're going to ovulate anywhere around mid-cycle. And then there's where the corpus luteum keeps our estrogen levels up and our progesterone levels up. And then if we don't have a fertilized egg, the corpus luteum dies, our progesterone estrogen levels drop. Now if you look at the bottom down here, you see the uterine phase and the ovarian phase. The ovarian phase is the follicular, which makes sense, the follicles, and the luteal phase is the excretion phase of the uterus, okay? So as those levels, the uterus grows, more blood flow, more arteries are developed, more blood flow to the area, because we're preparing the uterus to receive an egg and let it implant and grow. But then as those levels of hormones drop, bam, this is where you have your cycle. All right, did that make sense? Did that confuse you all like crazy? If you don't understand it, read it, and then when we get back together on Tuesday, we'll go over that cycle again. Follicular, you have ovarian cycle, uterus. Take follicular for to develop the egg, let the corpus luteum release the egg, keep the corpus luteum alive until the egg implants. If the egg doesn't implant, all our levels are dropping now because the corpus luteum is dying. And so if I don't have an, an egg that implants, I don't have any more progesterone, so then I excrete. So when you take oral contraceptives, they're keeping your hormone levels up. So guess what? Your pituitary doesn't stimulate follicle stimulating hormones, so you don't ovulate. That's the old basic oral contraceptives. It fakes out the brain to say, hey, my estrogen's high. I don't need follicle stimulating hormone because your levels don't drop. You're maintaining a higher level. So your ovulation occurs when your follicular is high. Your ovulation occurs from your follicle stimulating hormone because you have low estrogen and low progesterone. Okay. But when your estrogen and progesterone levels stay up, you don't have a follicle, your, your pituitary doesn't secrete follicle stimulating hormone. Okay. So you don't ovulate. Because you're, the egg is just waiting to be No, 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 you have to, when you're on oral contraceptives, you Oh, okay, gotcha, yeah, that, yeah. And they sign that door out there one more time. I'm going to, oh no, it's the end of class. So usually you guys are going to get down the same time everybody else. Look over these. Just understand what your menstruation is in these two cycles. And look here. Follicular is controlled by follicle stimulating hormone. This is what causes ovulation. Follicle stimulating hormone. Luteal phase is what keep, is making the uterus grow every month. If our hormones don't stay up, then we excrete it during the uterine cycle. This is our menstrual cycle. So we shed the lining of the uterus. Our levels are low, so we start the follicular phase all over again. Every month, your endometrium regenerates. Every month, your lining of your uterus regenerates to prepare for implantation of an egg until you start the menopause.